Hey, good morning, everybody. I guess I would ask folks um, their reason for coming to this session. If you had something uh, specific that you wanted to walk away with. And I think you can either talk or put it in the chat. Um, I'm actually here because I wanted to understand. Um, so I'm a parent of a, a child who has thyroid cancer, but she had had a, even a more, uh, it was a secondary cancer from a different, from when she was a, ch a child. So um, this is really trying to understand how to help her communicate better uh, with her doctor as she's learning her medical history and she's taking control of herself as uh, she's 20 plus now, so. Mm -hmm. But this session, I do it a little different every year, but issues certainly remain the same every year in that even those of you who made mention of what's tough and what you'd like to walk away with. Um, uh, I will introduce myself. Um, my name is Cheryl Lindell or Sherry Lindell. I work for a community college in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I've been a consultant for about 30 years on personality types and behavioral styles. So with that said, my stepfather had anaplastic thyroid cancer in 1997. Um, and I started an informal address book, an informal listserv, if you will. And uh, that was in 97. <clears throat> there were three or four of us who we're really seeking help for our parents. Uh, and we reached all around the world and we just stayed tight and we kept adding people into our email group. Um, over time, you know, it's here now in uh, 2022, we have, we folded into FICA. We went from about 30, 40 people uh, to well over 900 on our email support group. Um, my father passed away six months after diagnosis, uh, and that's not the case anymore for anaplastic. So I've been coming around since about 1998, 99. Um, who, when I say, who am I? So thyroid cancer and conversations are a big part of my life, uh, but I'm showing you pictures right now about the rest of my life. Uh, so these are my grandchildren. Looks like I have a bunch, but I only have two. And these are my rescue dogs. So, um, that's how I spend a lot of my time. Um, what I'm clear about is each of you have a story, whether it's children, grandchildren, and um, whether you're the one with cancer or your children or your spouse, um, you come to this table with a lot of roles. Um, and of course, uh, the values that we grew up with affect how we think about and cope. Uh, so I, I put some examples here and you can decide like what you relate to. You feel you have to be strong and protect your friends and family. You seek support and turn to loved ones or other survivors. You ask for help from counselors or the professionals. Here's the flip side. You never ask for help from counselors or other professionals. Uh, and some folks turn to their faith. Um, so I, I put this one up here because everything is related to trust, right? Everything, everything is related to trust. Whether you tell me stuff, whether I tell you stuff, uh, whether my child tells me stuff, um, trusting that we're heard. Uh, it's like your medical team. What someone put in chat had to do with, how can I handle the fact that my medical team doesn't hear me or seem to understand. Um, so, you know, this image here, uh, I ran ropes courses full time for a large part of my career. Uh, and it was totally connected to trust and emotion. You know, the, the notion around emotion, that, that rhymed, I didn't intend. Um, emotion can propel us and can stop us. And here's a fact that many of us won't like, and I didn't, and that is that I'm powerless over anyone else. 
I can only do my part, right? I can only do my side of the street. So you can't change your, met, your physicians and their personalities or their style, but you can let your medical team go and find another one. Um, I think there's a, a tad of intimidation that happens when it comes to um, someone in, a, in power, position of power, and we make stuff up about the fact that they're, oh, they're so intelligent and schooled and educated. And so the way they do it must be right. Uh, not true. There are a lot of physicians, oncologists um, who have emotional intelligence and it's okay to go find those. I also know what I'm saying is takes time, uh, but I hope folks feel empowered to fire their doctors uh, because what you need during your journey is important. Um, and many physicians do not go through um, the learning and the competency-based uh, skills of emotional intelligence. You're not born with it. <clears throat> Doctors aren't born with emotional intelligence and we're not born with it. It's something we have to recognize, be aware of, um, and be willing to shift our behaviors. So as you look at this list, can you think of anybody? Can you see some traits in you? So a sudden emotional outburst, refusing to listen to other points of view, blaming others, lack of empathy. So the person, um, I forget who put that, maybe. Uh, so I forget who put that, but I think a couple of you put it about your medical team not seeming to listen or understand. Signs of low emotional intelligence. And it's well, so it's so crazy okay for you to require that in your medical team is a high emotional intelligence. They're not born with it. And um, you're a human first. So humans have these kinds of needs, right? Um, all right, so a lot, of, a lot of my slides are gonna be splatter paint. That's kind of how I uh, probably address what I, how I create, I don't know, PowerPoints, but um, you have to take care of yourself first. So um, mom who's in here with, a, with an adult child, I don't think this is rocket science. So I do think you guys already know this kind of stuff, um, but I also know it provokes anxiety because taking the time for you can feel, um, you can feel guilty doing that. So what we don't know, and then this is true for so many things, you've got to go slow to go fast when it comes to taking care of those in our circle. You got to go slow to go fast. I mean, you've got to take the time to fill your cup up. I know you've all heard that uh, metaphor around the oxygen mass in your cars, cars in your airplanes, um, you got to put it on you first. So these are just uh, suggestions for your five minute self care. Uh, so I would just say that. Um, so you know, it's just those little bitty tools that if you can't do it on your own, you need prompts to practice it. Yeah, so, and you guys also can have this uh, PowerPoint. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Brene Brown, but everyone in the room, I would encourage you to watch a Brene Brown TED Talk. Uh, go to YouTube. So um, her name's there, B-R-E-N-E, Brene Brown. So her, uh, her videos, this is around vulnerability. That's what she speaks on. And you can raise your hand right now about um, whether or not uh, you like feeling vulnerable. Chances are you don't. Um, but being vulnerable invites um, other people to do the same. It invites uh, a rigor of honesty. Um, vulnerability, 
displaying it to practice. And back to trust, oftentimes we're not gonna display that if we don't trust those around us. Um, but check out Brene Brown. She'll be a good uh, kind of a gauge on your um, practice of vulnerability. So expectations, sometimes now, so for caregivers and those of us walking through our own um, experiences with cancer, expectation. When I expect someone to react or respond a certain way, I already know there's times I'm gonna be let down. So my serenity is inversely proportionate to my expectations when it comes to other people's responses. And this is true for your medical team too. Your serenity is inversely proportionate to your expectations. So if you can trust, if you go in and you trust that they are knowledgeable, seem to have a good plan in place, I still think emotional intelligence is important. And if you're going to the top oncologist, like from a center of excellence, we may have to practice this ourselves versus you know firing them. Um, just a thought. Know that I don't have the answers to a bunch of this stuff, but uh, I will say things that has helped me over time. And um, emotional intelligence is a practice. Uh, so all of us have these four window panes to our soul, to who we are, okay? Um, the self-awareness is your ability to name your emotion when you're feeling it. You know, when you're sad, hurt, angry, frustrated, anxious, it's your ability to name the emotion that you're having. So that's self-awareness. If on a scale of one to five, you can say, I'm a five, I can absolutely name my emotion when I'm feeling it, I can identify it. One is, you know what? Sometimes I have no clue what I'm feeling. So move over to self-management on a scale of one to five. Self-management is you're having a high emotion and you act on it. You hit send on that uh, rigorously honest email. Uh, Self-management is you don't hit send, okay? So when it comes to being a five, you're good at self-management means you sleep on it. It means you bounce it off someone else. A one is like road rage. If someone cuts you off, yeah, you, it's on. Like now you're racing um, or you're flipping them off or something like that. Your emotion is in control. Um, Self-management is taking the time before you act. Social awareness, it's a competency. This is what we would hope our medical team, our significant others have this competency. It's, it's the ability to see emotion in others, the ability to identify when someone is sad, hurt, angry, anxious. Um, sometimes you might be wrong, but I urge all of you to tell um, the other person what you make up because we make up what we don't know. We just make it up. So I might say, Janet, I make up that you are really unhappy with what I just said. And you might go, oh yeah, I am. Cause you know, I wanna fire these doctors. I don't know. So Janet, I'm picking on you cause I know you and I love you. And um, so social awareness, it's okay to want that in others. We just have to remember we're powerless over other people. Oh, and we have to practice our own way of um, acceptance in other people. Um, so five on social awareness, as you can see emotion in others. One is someone could be crying in front of me and I not even notice. And you may have medical team members not even notice a tear. So let me move to relationship management. So I don't remember if you can see me. Can y'all see me? We can. Awesome. I think you said that to me before, but um, 
relationship management is when someone else's emotion is here, you stay here because you know that's not about you. Poor relationship management is when someone else's emotion is here, you rise to meet them. So if they're talking about your mama, you're like, oh, heck no. Now, now we're just going to go back and forth. But staying down here to salvage relationship is to allow that person to do or be that instead of meeting them where they are and being hooked. Um, so that's a high view, very high view of emotional intelligence. You can read more from Daniel Goleman. Um, I, I put this quote up here because I think it's important. We have to master our own practice. We have to master it. We have to know who we are and um, what our tendencies are because other people are judging us. Other people judge us. So here's a quote that's true. We judge people on behavior, right? We're judging our doctors and our uh, partners on behavior, but we judge ourselves on intention. So if we can explore their intention, because I, I never um, believe uh, that my significant other intends to hurt me. But I have to check it out uh, because their behavior is hurtful. So we all have a conflict style. We all do, uh, whether we want to or not. And other people can tell us. Yes, question? There was a couple questions that were put in chat. And uh, Janet, I think, had uh, worded this two different ways. But um, she is dealing with all new doctor teams in a new state. I guess she relocated. So yeah, Janet, I, yeah, I do, I get that. Um, and I, I remember when you moved um, and I wondered about that as well. Uh, and Diana, uh, the other issue. So you have always new residents and even more than one attending, uh, I'm gonna guess a uh, physician. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's just keeping in mind what we have control over and what we don't. We have to practice behaviors. Um, we have to practice emotional intelligence. We have to tell people what we make up about them. You can even tell your physician, you know, what you make up about them. See, I make up, sir, that you don't care. So ma'am, I make up, I mean, you, seem cold to me, but that's just me. Um, so I don't know if you agree with that or not. We give them the opportunity to tell us, you are spot on. I've got too many patients for me to uh, be compassionate with every one of you. Or they might say, I'm so sorry. I'm going a little too fast today and I'm not paying attention to the human element. But give them a chance to respond to what you are making up. Um, so, so I bring the conflict style thing up here uh, just to say, um, knowing what our conflict style is, um, and I'm not advancing. It's probably gonna advance really fast now in a minute because I've already hit, oh, okay, there we go. So my way or the highway, do you know people like that when it comes to conflict? Like you don't have a chance. Are you this? Like, hey, well, let's make a deal. Is it like, do you give in? Do you're like, let's compromise. Um, are you this? Hey, let's get two heads or better than one. Um, let's pull someone else in to see if they agree that you appear cold. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's really kind of doesn't fit here. But so this is only about conflict. Um, I'll think about it tomorrow. So many people would say in sessions we hold in person, um, if I were to say, if you're an avoider of conflict, raise your hand. Yeah, so many of you in here might be avoiders. It's just something to be conscious of uh, when it comes to your conflict style and know that behavior's choice, all of it, all of it. Now we're powerless over someone else's behavior, but we're not powerless over ours. And all behavior is choice. Now I've been in a session recently where someone said, that's not true, Sherry. 
um, sometimes I'm powerless over my own behavior. So we launched into some kind of in-depth conversation about when uh, provocation is um, causes me to behave a way that I, I was powerless over. That's just something to chew on. Behavior's choice. Um, and you know, the Kipling quotes is something to keep conscious um, because you might be going through stuff and it caused you to say some things that you don't mean, uh, just clean it up later. You know, that's really the only thing you can do because we're not gonna be perfect. We just clean it up. So, you know, I will say that um, many of you may know about your own innate preferences uh, and that's all this is, is innate preference when you look at uh, your personality type. Um, so your extrovert or introvert, that's that top EI. Sometimes you would put yourself um, more of an introvert than an extrovert and the other way around. That's where you get your energy. Extroverts recharge their batteries around other people and conversations. Introverts recharge their batteries alone. Noting where you are and where someone else is, is important in relationship. Um, so when we go through type, often other people say, well, it depends. And I will say this, you are born with certain preferences, but many times we're right down the middle on some of these preferences. Um, and that, that can be a factor of many things, how we were raised, our culture, um, our education, we've begun to practice a different behavior. And if you're an extreme on any of these types, um, when it comes to how it's broke down here, you've paid a price. So this second one is about your preference to incoming information. I am an extreme in, and the N stands for intuitive or it doesn't mean I am insanely intuitive. It doesn't mean that, not really. And the S stands for sensing. So what that means is, and I'll just describe S and N. S's are people who like details and intuitives are folks who really just want the big picture. S's go in order. One, two, three, four, five. Intuitives are okay with one, five, three, two. They can kind of jump around and they're comfortable. They're comfortable with reading a newspaper um, in the middle, uh, reading the ending of a book before they read the beginning. Sensors wouldn't do that. They like sequential uh, and chronological accuracy. Uh, sensors see the trees and intuitives see the forest. If a sensor has a headache, they may take something for it. An intuitive has a headache, they may say, it'll go away. If I just eat something, I'll just wait. So intuitives are dreamers. Um, if a sensor's in a bad relationship, they get out. Intuitives in a bad relationship, they may say, maybe tomorrow will be different. Maybe, um, maybe this will work when it comes to my cancer. So we need a balance of people in our lives, right? If you're not a detailed person, you probably need a detailed person to come with you to a doctor's appointment. Um, and we can, we can talk more about that. Uh, decisions, how you make decisions, that third line. We make decisions on either thinking, T, feeling, F. Thinkers make decisions on logic and facts. Feelers make decisions on emotion and values. So I'm gonna kind of take safe examples, like buying a car, and these are like big decisions, much like your cancer journey. Thinkers uh, would make a decision about the car they bought based on a consumer's buyer's guide, miles per gallon. Um, they would explore and research. Feelers make decisions on buying a car. The color is important. Uh, one way they've always thought was really cool, like I've always wanted a Deep. So, and, and it doesn't mean feelers don't think or thinkers don't feel. It doesn't mean that. But if you're an extreme, you've paid a price on thinking and feeling. 
structure means on the last one, JP, um, J stands for judging, P stands for perceiving. Does it mean J's are judgmental? Does it mean P's are so insanely perceptive? Uh, I, <laughs> so J's, and you might relate to this, are folks, if you're extreme, you separate your shirts from your pants in your closet. You separate your short sleeve from your long sleeve. You may separate by color. And if some of you out there right now are grinning because you relate, uh, peas might just be glad it's in the closet. You're like, eh, I made it into the closet this time. Um, and there doesn't have to be an order. Jay's like an order. So, you know, this is just a little bit of type, but I'm gonna give you a free website to go to if you want to see kind of how you might answer these questions. And so uh, 16 personalitytypes.com or humanmetrics.com. Those are free sites uh, that can tell you what your uh, Myers Briggs type is. And many of you can relate to this right here. Um, so I, I will put it in chat what these websites are. Uh, so that you can check it out if you want to. But also know that sometimes we answer questions on these assessments based on the way we want to be. Uh, so I'm a J wannabe. I can tell you that. I'm a J wannabe. And the fact that my husband and I are both perceiving is a nightmare. Okay. Um, so feeling can cause you to shift your behavior to make up the difference of the people around you. And it might not be your nature, but it's your practice to behave a different way. So judging, I made a schedule for every day of our vacation and I'm so happy. Perceivers are like, there's a schedule. Yeah, a little funny ditty. You might be able to read it. And we prefer others to be like, we are kind of like, what do you mean you made a schedule? Or what do you mean you don't want to go by the schedule? It makes our day more efficient and effective with our time. Yeah, so that's just the orientation to outer world there. So you might have been relating to some of that, right? Um, so, th so this is my family story, right? My, uh, so this is my stepdad, Bob. Uh, diagnosed in uh, uh, September 1997, uh, passed away April 1998. So back then, anaplastic was definitely uh, kind of that death sentence. And um, knowing a lot of people with anaplastic thyroid cancer, I, I do, um, and my, um, my cohort, my colleague, Patty Turner and I, we moderate a uh, once a month Zoom session for anaplastic um, survivors. Um, it is no longer a death sentence. So much has changed with uh, immunotherapy and a lot of other things. So, but my dad, let me tell you the story because you may be experiencing this as well. So Nita is my mother. My Bob, my Bob, my uh, stepdad was an introvert. My mom was a party person. She was an extrovert. She had to have people around her. Okay, very different. Um, they were both detailed people. Uh, they balanced their checkbooks to the penny. So they kind of matched there, okay? But Bob was a thinker, my mom was a feeler. So um, Bob's oncologist was matter of fact. Um, I guess I should say, yeah, this was his, the chemo on cut. So he said, uh, go home and get your affairs in order. My mom said, I cannot believe you just said that. Like, no, we're gonna have hope. Uh, my mom was a wreck. Bob wanted the facts. Bob was at peace, but needed the facts. In fact, got very upset with my mom for demanding um, this medical doctor change his language. He wanted to look for a new doctor and Bob didn't. So it caused conflict in the midst of stress. Uh, Bob would be just happy. He had his socks in a drawer. My mom was like, we are 
folding matched socks. Uh, and they were both extremes on their temperament for T and F. Um, and they were extremes in JF. It, it caused conflict. Um, and if we don't appreciate differences, it will. So in intimate relationships, especially in times of stress, when it comes to cancer, appreciating we weren't all born with a certain way um, and we didn't, um, so we forge it over time. So, so I just put that out there to see or, or to allow you to consider what those differences is that differences are for you and your medical team uh, and your intimate relationships. Um, you know, one other way of you all just looking at who you are, remember we have to be a master of self before we have these relationships uh, with our medical team, with our loved ones. Um, and all of us for the, most, <laughs> for the most part is strong in one of these. And, and maybe I'll stop to and ask, are there, are there any chats any questions in the chat right now or thoughts? Diana was asking, how do you handle medical providers who seem to not understand your issues and concern? You know, again, it's really just, it's about us. Um, you can fire them, know that. You can tell them what you're making up and what you make up right now is, it doesn't seem to me you understand my concerns. Um, can we discuss that again? So, you know, you can walk into your appointments with um, questions and a script. You can walk in with a script. And so, Diane, it's just not um, unreasonable to fire them and move on. You are your best advocate. You are your best one. So. It, it's not good to go through this journey with a medical team that doesn't seem to understand. And I try and connect with people at this conference um, and find out how they ever fired someone when it comes to a medical professional. I would also tell doctors at this conference um, how these other physicians, like what they're saying that makes you think that they don't understand. Um, because you will find the most uh, compassionate and competent listeners in terms of our physicians at this conference. So, you know, I don't know that that helps, but I, I know you don't have any control over them. You just have control over you. So I don't know if that helps at all, but I hope so. Are there any others, Jim, that are in the chat? Uh, Irene was asking, how do I get my doctors to believe me and respect me? Mm. Isn't that frustrating? Isn't that frustrating um, when you make up based on their behavior that they don't believe you? You make that up. So, and you may have already done this. You've said, you know, I'm making up that you don't believe what I'm saying, or you don't trust that what I'm saying um, is fact. So you, you really can't get them to, you can only check it out and trust your reality and then fire them if they're not someone who is respecting you. So you're in charge, they're not in charge. The only thing that we lean into with our medical team is their knowledge. So if you've researched and they're like at the center of excellence and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're one of the best, then we've got a, you know, form our support group around us and bounce things off of them about how to continue to be with that team. Uh, but, you know, I, and what I know is there's many times I make up something that's way not true. I know I do that. Um, when someone sends me an email and they don't sign off, you know, at the bottom of the email, uh, warmly. Joe, or sincerely, or love, or they don't say that, I make up they're being kind of cold. They're detached. They're really not into um, being kind. And that's so far from the truth for me. And, you know, it's just my practice. Um, it, there, there's a, a saying that you all, well, you all know the golden rule, do unto others the way you would want to be done unto. Platinum rule is what we should practice 
And it doesn't mean our doctors practice that, but it'd be great if they did. And that is do unto others the way they would want to be done unto. Like our child might be completely different personality type or behavioral styles. Um, and if we want good relationships, we practice platinum rule. But we don't need to take care of our doctor's feelings. Remember that. We don't. We're the ones in charge and we're the ones going through a journey of a diagnosis that we had never planned on going through. So, you know, with that said, I, I would just um, consider moving on to another team. And I know that's easier said than done. And I know, especially um, if you're dealing with an aggressive form of cancer where time is critical. So, perfect, Cam. Absolutely. I love that. And it's true. Um, so, Cam put in chat, and I hope you're all kind of maybe navigating back and forth to chat because you guys have as much to offer each other as, uh, you know, many of us as presenters do. Uh, I know you have as much. Um, this is your life. Yep. We are our best advocates. Um, so I, I'm going to just pull up a few more of these slides um, uh, just to kind of brush through them. And then we'll just move on to, uh, to talking. Um, and I think we're kind of close to over as well. And I can't get my, so I'll just stay right there because it gets you. Um, so that's just a quote that I've found to be true. And I'm certain that you would find it to be true as well. Um, to have balance is uh, for all of these. Um, I've always done this particular balance thing with five, which means it excluded family, um, but physical, social, intellectual, emotional, spiritual. Um, we got to have balance. It's just kind of like the baby mobile, you know, the mobile that hangs above a baby bed and you wind it up and it turns and it's got music. Uh, if you cut one of those off, it hangs crooked. And that's what happens with this. If one of these you're not practicing balance in, it'll hang crooked. Um, beliefs do drive um, behavior. Beliefs unconsciously drive our decisions. So, you know, that, that's a little, a little deeper, but it's something to consider. Uh, connecting with loving people. Um, you don't have to go through this alone. Many, uh, many folks who are introverts, it's your practice to kind of recharge alone. And this may be the time in your life or in your loved one's life when um, comfort from others um, could be required. Um, with that said, Let's just, because um, I am conscious of time, let's just uh, post some questions or comments, because uh, I hope some of that was helpful. Um, I will give you, I, I can send this PowerPoint to you. Um, I started to go over that behavioral style instrument, which was DISC, and all of us have a preference towards one of those styles. I am not direct and straightforward. My husband is. So I'm polar opposite on that quadrant. Um, so that we've got to get good at all four of those styles. And, and you are good at one or two of them. But we've got to be good at all of them because it's a practice. All behavior is choice. <clears throat> Let's see, I recommend reading Dr. Bernie Siegel and Dr. Naomi Raymond, very helpful. Perfect, Janet, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I will put in chat Brene Brown's work. Look at her TED Talks, her YouTubes, and then she's got her books. And um, the Myers-Briggs, this is a free one, humanmetrics.com or 16 personalities. Dot com. So any other books or thoughts or people or YouTubes or TED Talks you want to put in chat to help others, 
just, you know, that emotional intelligence, I think, is so important. And I'm always impressed with our medical folks that show up at psycho conferences. Their emotional intelligence is out of this world. And they take time to answer questions. Um, if you told any one of our doctors that you have a, a medical person that doesn't seem to respect you, I guarantee you, the folks here would say, fire them, find another doctor. And, and I'm saying the medical doctors here would say that. Any other challenges you guys have with regards to your relationships or your medical teams? I hope you're having a wonderful conference. I, you know, I just urge you to use your voice this weekend, uh, seek people out, be, um, what is the word, persistent and audacious. I mean, just um, be in so crazy control of your life. You guys don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I've been with Psycho a long time and I love this, um, this nonprofit, this is about research. You know, we're, we want to rid ourselves. You're, you're welcome, Gita. Gita. So, all right. I will see many of you again, I'm certain. So go to Dr. Lorches, those of you uh, in here um, that are dealing with anaplastic. So I can't, yeah, so Cam, definitely. Are, are you going to Dr. Lorch, Cam? Okay. Yes, I'll be there. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I'm glad you came, Cam, Barbie, Janet. Great to see you, Janet. Are you liking your new home? I'll see you there. See, now I see names and faces. Glenn, yes, I, okay, yeah. So Janet, are you liking your new home? Yes, yes. I'm glad. Yes. It's been many years since we've seen each other. Many, many years. Maybe the next conference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to in-person. All right. So write me if you would like a copy of my, uh, of the PowerPoint. I'm certainly happy, happy to send that. All right, yes. Or if you just wanna unmute and talk to me, you may. Yes, and you're so welcome. Yes, Glenn, we'll see you there. People may be popping in now for the next session. Jim, you were amazing, thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. And I hope everybody enjoyed uh, the presentation today. And uh, we did uh, repost your email. Okay. So everybody saw that. And um, be sure to check out the schedule for the following uh, events today and tomorrow. Yes. And are we okay to end our session now, Sherry? I believe so. All right. Well, thank you very much. Beautiful presentation. And everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye, Glenn and Barbie. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>